Thanks to both uh, Becca uh, and Matthew uh, for giving the opportunity to come speak here, and particularly to be able to speak on something other than foster removal structures. So that's always uh, that's always exciting for me. All right, so <clears throat> soil testing recommendations. So the impetus behind improving soil test fertility recommendations is uh, twofold. Increasing agronomic production efficiency and economic efficiency go along with that, and also reducing non-point losses of phosphorus. So we consider our traditional soil, soil phosphorus testing, it's, it's, uh, it's empirical. Imagine we have our, our uh, 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 soil test phosphorus level, some type of an extractant, uh, and in response to that we have yield or relative yield. And obviously as we increase soil test phosphorus concentration, yield increases until some, some, at some point critical level or threshold where additional phosphorus no longer results in improved yield. Um, this, is, this is how it's typically, typically shown, this classic fertility textbook. But in, re in reality, when you look at the data, it looks like this. A shotgun blast of data, uh, may, probably uh, varying because of different conditions, different soils. So, you know, you look at that, well, for your soil, your conditions, your relationship might, not, might look like this. You'd have a different critical level. You know, for another soil, maybe something like that, a little steeper or something like this. It's tough telling, but on average, you know, what we see is the line, and that's what the recommendations are based on, is that average. And so if you're perfectly, if you're perfectly average soil in conditions, that's great, but chances are you may either, you could either be over applying or under applying, depending on which side of the line that you fall. Now you consider how agronomic soil test ext extracts work. Um, they were designed, and they were designed very well, I might, I might add. I'm not, uh, I'm not knocking these things. The, the scientists who developed these were really, really good chemists. But anyway, they were designed to dissolve a subsection of different phosphorus pools. Um, they, they were designed to, to, to kind of grab a little piece of, of all these different pools, various inorganic and organic pools, and the goal is to dissolve what will become soluble over the growing season. And while the absolute value may not be what is available to the plant, it's correlated to what will be available to the plant. It's, a very, it's very empirical. It's not bad, but it, it is, uh, this is, this is what we've had. This is what we've got to work with. It's a quote from uh, something that Stanley Barber wrote in his, uh, in his book, Soil Nutrient Bioavailability. <clears throat> regarding empirical versus mechanistic soil testing and fertilizer recommendations. He said, the most commonly used tests extract some portion of the labile soil phosphorus pool. However, when different soils are used, solution phosphorus concentration, buffer capacity, and diffusion rates may not be correlated. Therefore, any one of the values would not be correlated with predicted phosphorus uptake, and the simpler soil test, i.e. Your, your, your normal extract, would would not be more reliable. Now, of course, that's coming from a guy who developed a, uh, a, me a mechanistic model that unfortunately only got used by um, very small groups of researchers, mostly plant physiologists doing uh, very detailed research on nutrient uptake. But here's an example of that. This is, this is what he's talking about. So here's three different soils, and we have um, uh, heavy clay soil down to a sandy soil. This is in North Carolina, growing soybean. And you can see the, the, the critical value varies for each soil. The first one, the heavy soil, your critical threshold value, you only need nine pounds of phosphorus per acre to hit maximum yield on that soil. But you need 18 pounds per acre for this soil. On the sandy soil, you only need, you, you, you need, you need more, you need 27 pounds per acre. So it kind of illustrates what, what it was he was talking about. And that, that's, that's, that's the reason why you have such scatter in that relationship when you group all soils and conditions together. Here's another example. Here's a site in northern Indiana. This is a soybean field. This is a harvest uh, yield map. And uh, this was a, a soil that was uh, low in, in malic-3 phosphorus. It 
Uh, it should have responded to phosphorus. We chose this field on purpose because, uh, as a demonstration, because the farmer told us, he, he said, I got this, I have some fields that they're low in soil test phosphorus, but they never respond. Even when I apply phosphorus, they never respond. So we want to take a look at it. So we put three phosphorus rich strips throughout the field, and uh, here's the resulting yield. No difference in yield between the strips, whether phosphorus is applied or not. Now, why? That's for soybean. The next year, I should say the following, following crop season, he planted rye uh, after he harvested those beans. And this is a, a, a satellite uh, remote sensing image of the rye. Okay, so the soybean wasn't responsive, but apparently the rye was very responsive. Uh, you can see the green strips uh, showing up from the rye. You could see them from the road. So it's not always under application, or sorry, it's not always over application. There's, there's also potentially issues of under application as well. It goes both ways. <clears throat> so don't assume that the recommendations, the soil phosphorus recommendations are always on the side of over application. Consider that uh, when we produce higher yields for whatever reason, better crop genetics, um, improved soil health, um, all contributes to, to uh, improve yields. Uh, may, may means greater phosphorus uptake, which may require um, greater phosphorus applications or at least more frequent applications. Uh, this was noted in a long-term no-till study by uh, Carlin. It was at least 20 years no-till, and uh, they concluded that soil test phosphorus and potassium measurements, as well as the calculated phosphorus and potassium removal, suggest that nutrient mining occurred. In other words, when they follow the nutrient uh, the, 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 the standard nutrient recommendations in soil testing, um, it wasn't enough. When they applied based on that, wh what they had applied still was not enough. So it's not always over application. Here's an example. Some, some people claim, you know, they say, oh, we, we don't, we, we, we're, uh, we, we never under apply. We, I've never seen any purple corn. One thing you need to keep in mind is that Corn generally only turns purple, and other crops only turn purple with phosphorus deficiency, a visible phosphorus deficiency, very rarely. That's extreme conditions. Uh, you, you have hidden hunger, and a lot of times uh, you, you just won't see it. I'll give you an example here. This is a corn plant you can see growing through various stages. It looked perfectly healthy all the way through, but it was, it, this, was a, this was a deficient plant. Its yield was deficient because of phosphorus. It was a controlled experiment. Okay, so we, as we start this, this discussion on um, moving from empirical to a, a more mechanistic means of uh, making fertilizer recommendations, uh, we need to establish some definitions. I use the term uh, effective bioavailability. And what I mean by that is that for, for a nutrient to be effectively bioavailable, it must be in solution, in other words, it needs to be dissolved, it needs to be in the proper chemical form for uptake, for example, Plants don't uptake organic phosphorus. Um, they uptake uh, inorganic phosphorus. And third, the nutrient must be in the vicinity of the plant root at the time of uptake. So the thing to keep in mind through all this is that plants take up nutrients from solution, not from the soil. The soil has to uh, uh, provide that nutrient into solution by whatever means before the plant can get to it. So it's a double-edged sword when it comes to water quality then. We need the nutrient to be in solution for the plant to be able to access it, but once it's in solution, now it's vulnerable for transport as well. So it's a real, it can make it tricky for management depending on the conditions. To briefly illustrate that, if we, if we uh, uh, put the uh, soil nutrients into two large crude pools, I might add as, as a soil scientist, we'd say we could split the soil nutrient pools into labile and non-labile. And those two pools are in equilibrium with each other. And then that labile pool is, is in equilibrium with the solution pool. And it's that, it's that solution pool is what feeds, is what the plant roots have access to. So again, the, nutrient, the soil is the nutrient warehouse, essentially very different, various uh, different uh, lability, which supplies the solution, allowing the plant to get it. We need to keep that in mind. Um, so the uptake of, of uh, of solution phosphorus by plants is a function of the solution phosphorus concentration, what's dissolved in solution, the ability of the soil to continue to replenish that solution, we call that the that source, the, the quantity, since solution is, is called the intensity, and then there's three ways 
for the plant to obtain solution phosphorus. But all three of these depend on root architecture, solubility, it needs to be in solution, and the location of the phosphorus. Phosphorus needs to be near the roots. And those three is, uh, are uh, root interception, a bulk flow. Bulk flow is just uh, is simply um, uh, as, 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 as plants are taking up water, any, any dissolved nutrient that happens to be moving with that flow can be taken up by the plant. And then the big one is diffusion. Diffusion is the most important for phosphorus. Uh, it's highly dependent on location. Here's an example. So diffusion essentially works by concentration gradient. If you have a lower concentration near your plant roots, higher concentration of phosphorus outside of that, uh, that concentration gradient will drive the phosphorus towards it exaggerating here on scale. This, is, this only occurs on, 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 on the scale of millimeters. And we can, uh, it, it is the dominant mechanism, but it is very slow and it is short range as well. And we can describe this uh, mathematically using a, uh, combining a fixed law um, uh, with some other parameters, but it's a function of the concentration gradient, the distance, the buffer capacity of the soil, the ability of that soil to keep buffering that solution, and then the raw diffusion coefficient of phosphorus itself in water. So we can describe that mathematically, and then once the phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus, that is, is near the roots, it can be taken up by the plant, and we can describe that mathematically as well using uh, michaelis menten uh, kinetics. So you put those together, You've got ion, the phosphorus, or this, this, this is true for, for nutrient uptake of, of any ion. Um, ion movement towards the roots through diffusion and through mass flow. And balance that out with the uptake by the plant. And you've got yourself the basis for a model. And this is what Stanley Barber, this, this is the model essentially that he developed. There's a lot of other equations that go into these, the, those different variables. But um, he solved this, or I should say, uh, uh, John Cushman solved this for the, uh, in, in the transient state uh, using the Crank-Nicholson method uh, in 1980. When he did it, it was a, it was a really, really big deal. They were, the, they were the first to do this. And um, Dr. Barber got uh, uh, a lot of awards for that at the time. It, it was a big deal. So different plants require different concentrations of phosphorus in solution in order to re meet the required mass. At the end of the day, you've got a certain mass of phosphorus that needs to be in that plant to meet maximum yield. And there's been estimates of what those dissolved peak concentrations need to be for different crops. We call this the external phosphorus requirement, but it's not universal. There was a group of scientists in the late 70s who assumed it was universal. Um, it's not universal. And the reason why uh, is because that, that, that external solution requirement varies with phosphorus buffer capacity and also with texture. If you look at the diffusion coefficient as part of that previous equation I showed you, uh, you can see buffer capacity is a major component of that along with tortuosity, both of which are uh, a function of various different soil properties. It's probably the best way to illustrate it. Um, so while the, 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 the external solution concentration requirement is not universal across plants, the mass requirement is. Think of the mass requirement as the load, right? So um, on average, you know, corn, after 120 days, it needs to have around 550 milligrams put in the biomass in 120 days. The question is, how are you going to get that 550 milligrams into it? Well, consider the first scenario. All right, you've got your soil-bound phosphorus, your quantity. It's in equilibrium with the solution phosphorus pool, and it, uh, it, it desorbs out. Let's say in this case on the left, it's able to provide 0 0.8 milligrams of P per liter to solution for the plant to uptake. So in this system, the soil would have to replenish this solution on average 19 times per day in order to meet 550 milligrams uh, uptake after 120 days. That doesn't mean that you have to have 0.8 milligrams per liter in solution. Um, there's other ways to do it. In this, can, in this situation, say different soil, it's equal, the equilibrium of that soil bound P with the solution P, it, it provides only, maintains only around 0 0.2 milligrams per liter in that solution for the plant, for the roots to have, have access to, it would have to be able to buffer that and keep resupplying it 76 times per day. So we could do it as well. 
Um, the question is, does it have the ability to buffer it 76 times per day? But at the end of the day, 550 milligrams, how are you going to get it into the plant? So that er external dissolved soluble concentration, it's, it's, it's a moving target. It's a moving target to hit the proper load, to put it in, in, in water quality language. Um, but we don't, we don't measure what's in solution. We don't measure the intensity. Instead, we measure the soul-bound phosphorus, which is the quantity with traditional soil testing. So how much phosphorus on the soil do we need? Well, that's the, that's the hard part. It depends on the ability of the soil to keep resupplying that solution. And that is what's known as the quantity-intensity relationship, uh, which is a function of soil properties, uh, such as mineralogy, texture, organic matter, pH. And obviously, it depends on how much phosphorus is in that soil as well. Um, the kinetics of that reaction can have a big impact as well. Barber assumed uh, that uh, plant uptake uh, was, the mo was, uh, was limiting, so he, he ignored kinetics. I think that's a part, something that could be improved in that model, something that uh, we're going to take a look at. Um, the soil phosphorus requirement also depends on the physical location of phosphorus. It's not good enough that the, plant, that the soil can just dish out 0.2 parts per million or whatever it happens to be. It has to be close enough to the root so it can diffuse to it. So here's the example, quantity, intensity. Here's, a, here's an example. Um, it's your phosphorus, adsorbed phosphorus on the solid, on the soil, that's your quantity. Phosphorus in solution, that's your intensity. And you can see it varies dramatically. That relationship varies dramatically. It's your buffering, it's essentially buffering. It varies um, a lot between different soil types. And, you know, usually heavy soils are, are going to be more buffered than lighter soils, but not always. Texture is not the only factor. Here's the most poorly buffered soil down here it has greater than 70% clay. So why, why is it well buffered? In this case, it's mineralogy. That soil is dominated by two to one clay minerals. They're not well buffered. So there's other factors that go into it, not just, not just texture. Soil pH is one of those. Um, we tend to have optimum solubility. Again, that phosphorus has to get in solution for the plants to get it. Optimum solubility around a pH of uh, 6.5. Below that, we tend to have phosphorus associated with iron and aluminum. Above it, um, calcium. All right, but consider malic three on the other hand. Um, so before I jump to malic three, I should say, so lower pH levels usually means there's less phosphorus in solution, less ability to uptake it. But malic three on the other hand is is more efficient at extracting phosphorus at lower pH levels. So um, Malik 3 and other soil test extracts, sometimes they can be misleading if they're used alone, not in combination with, uh, with other soil properties. Now, ideally, um, Malik 3 used in combination with something like water soluble P can be very powerful as an indicator of quantity and intensity, but alone, it, it, it can be misleading at times. Okay, so we know, once we figure out how much soil phosphorus we need, how much fertilizer do we need to add? Well, it depends on what your target soil phosphorus level is, which is going to be a function of that moving target of the external soluble concentration. And then in order to meet that target soil phosphorus concentration, um, how much fertilizer do you need to add? Well, that's going to depend on the fertilizer soil phosphorus relationship, which is a function of soil properties. Just a quick example of that. Actually, this is from some of Andrew's old work back in the day. Um, the relationship between phosphorus added and soil test phosphorus, there's two types here, strip phosphorus and then malic 3. But the point is, the, the, that relationship, you add uh, 300 pounds per acre of phosphorus to two soils that have the same malic 3 value, the different soil properties, you're going to end up with different values at the end of that. It, it varies. So that needs to be taken into account as well. Ideally, ide for an ideal process, you'd start with the foundation uh, mechanistically having knowledge of how much phosphorus, what mass of phosphorus do you want in your plant at the end of the day? All right, and that's going to vary between crop, obviously, and it's also going to vary between, well, it may vary between cultivars. That's something we're, we're, uh, we're, we're testing right now. All right, let's just say 550 milligrams. How am I going to get that 550 milligrams into the plant? So th I think of it as two arms. You've got to be able to supply it, and you've got to be able to move it. So you've got the supply chain, the, the supply on one side, which is 
um, a function of quantity, intensity relationships, fertilizer soil P relationships, which are both going to be controlled by soil properties. That gets it into solution. How fast does it get into solution? That's, 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 that, is that important? And then not only does it have to get into solution, but it needs to be able to move. It, it needs to be located near the roots for the phosphorus to get it, at least for phosphorus. So this isn't true for nitrogen. And the phosphorus location and movement of it is going to be a function of soil management ver and, and also soil properties as well. Now obviously we're not going to, this is what Barber did. Um, and he measured all these things explicitly, right? It was, a, it was a mechanistic model that wasn't, it wasn't to be used for soil testing. And what I'm proposing is that we can adapt this to soil testing. Maybe not necessarily measure all these things explicitly, but use the, this, ascertain this information and, and then m continue to use soil, soil extractable phosphorus, but make, from all this Im other information, make a well-informed shortcut to jump to soil extractable, uh, what, in other words, what, uh, what soil test value do we need for our regular routine tests for those conditions, for those soils, to get 550 milligrams of phosphorus in that particular plant at the end of the day. So our current recommendations, um, they, they are empirical, they're, they're not terrible, but they are outdated. They're based on uh, soil samples taken from zero to six inches, so it's not representative of no-till conditions, uh, which has a big impact. A again, uh, um, recall from, from the previous slide, location of the phosphorus is, a, is very important. And it's also based on empirical calibrations that were conducted 30 to 50 years ago that had no, no consideration for different soil types or conditions. And consider that, that we, our, our uh, crop varieties are very different now as well. So if you apply this, 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 uh, this view to our current uh, empirical method, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't consider a whole lot of these um, uh, factors. And yeah, I would argue that it takes a shortcut, but it takes a less informed shortcut. Okay, um, I gotta mention something about soil quality because uh, soil quality and soil health. I hear a lot of uh, uh, soil health gurus, a lot of the regional soil health uh, people say a lot of crazy things about nutrient management and nutrient cycling uh, with regard to soil health. I love soil health. It is wonderful. I'm a big proponent of it. But uh, soil health uh, can only improve phosphorus accessibility. It does not defeat the mass requirement. You cannot defeat the laws of thermodynamics. If your plant needs 550 milligrams, you got to get it into it. So how can it do that? How can it improve accessibility? Well, um, deeper roots, more roots, the more root surface area, you see that by looking at, this, at the Barbara Cushman model, more root surface area, uh, the more phosphorus you can take up. Um, free living rhizosphere microorganisms, they might be able to play some role in it. Although some argue that uh, you know, growing plants in sterile soils um, makes no difference, uh, but there may be some sort of uh, feedback between that and the root, and the root excreting certain type of uh, uh, certain types of chelating compounds. That's a possibility. A more uh, realistic possibility, actually, it is well documented, is the uh, is a, a symbiotic relationship between roots with mycorrhizae, um, which is much much more common in uh, no-till soils and, and healthy soils than you would have in a conventionally tilled soil. Also, soil health it changes soil properties. Therefore, it can have dramatic changes to the quantity intensity relationship. It may be for good. It may be for bad. It depends. It depends on the properties. So I get tired of hearing things like this from soil health people. I don't need to fertilize with phosphorus anymore, okay? And that, uh, and I, I, I believe that they have not had to uh, need to apply phosphorus maybe recently over the past few years since their soils have become more healthy, but um, you can't make something out of nothing, all right? Unless you're God. Um, so it's temporary. Right? This is, this, is, this is a temporary thing. The soil, it, and it makes sense. I mean, the soil is very, very buffered. Uh, or phosphorus is very buffered. The nature of soil phosphorus is that it's very buffered. So yeah, you could get away with this for years, especially if you're improving the accessibility of phosphorus to the roots. But eventually, 
you keep taking up 550 milligrams per corn plant, you're gonna have to replace it. So only changes in genetics is going to change the phosphorus mass that's required by a plant at the end of the day. So the current phosphorus recommendations, I'll say they're not bad. They definitely get us in the ballpark. They're not precise, and that lack of precision gives us a lot of room for improving them, for saving money, and also um, uh, reducing phosphorus losses. Hey, if you improve the health of your soil or change uh, based on your soil properties, if you only need to maintain a, a malic 3 level of, of 5 milligrams per kilogram for your soil instead of 15, then that's a, that's a win for water quality. Your plant still gets enough phosphorus, and uh, you don't have as much uh, phosphorus, uh, uh, vulnerable phosphorus out there that could be transported. So the long-term goal is to, uh, my long-term goal at least, is to utilize and improve the Barbara Cushman model for developing more precise and condition-specific fertility uh, recommendations. I'd like to use that model as a guide and uh, basically by considering you know, the required phosphorus mass uptake between different cultivars, um, consider plant uptake kinetic curves and the kinetics of phosphorus release from the soils, uh, incorporate root modeling, uh, predict root solution phosphorus concentration kinetics um, using easily obtained parameters, and consider it at different depths rather than just a zero to six inch depth. So, I'm proposing that, that hopefully that we'll continue to still be able to use soil test P extracts, but vary the optimum level depending on the soil crop and conditions. Um, real quick, this so I'm wor starting out working on that first step with the crops, um, trying to determine if the maximum required, uh, trying to determine what phosphorus uh, mass is required in the plant, what minimum mass is required to reach optimum yield. And we're doing this under controlled conditions, very controlled conditions, and uh, using uh, hydroponics in a in a growth room. We're also working on collecting soils from around the country to start to look at the ability of those soils. Uh, quantity, intensity, and particularly the kinetics of that. All right, there's a lot there. Um, any questions?